Hi guys, this is David Negrin, host of The Script Podcast and executive director of the NYC Screenwriters Collective. I'm excited to announce that we've created a Patreon campaign for The Script. Patreon is like a Kickstarter, but it allows you to give ongoing pledges every month and receive ongoing rewards. Of course, The Script Podcast will continue to be free, but we're just asking for a little help. So please, check out all our rewards, join our inner circle. Become a patron of The Script Podcast at patreon.com slash the script. Miss Martha! Is he dead? No, you're our most unwelcome visitor. He seems to be a sensitive person. Does he? It seems the enemy is not what we believe. This is The Script, the podcast for screenwriters by screenwriters, the deepest story analysis anywhere on the internet. At The Script, we believe story moves pages, story moves product, story moves people. I'm your host, David Negrin. Joining me tonight, Alka Kushalani and Christina Leith Malin. Tonight, we analyze The Beguiled, the latest from Sofia Coppola. Guys, Sophia's back. We're we're all so excited to have her back. You know, everybody's cheering for Sophia. Um, Virgin Suicides, Lost in Translation, Marie Antoinette, Somewhere, The Bling Ring. A uh, lot of our a lot of great films in there, and everyone really loves uh, Sophia's style. The Beguiled is a remake, right? Um, and I'm, I'm going to, I want to hear what you guys think. I just want to start the podcast with um, the artists, uh, Sofia Coppola directed and wrote, the, uh, it, written for the screen by Sofia Coppola, based on the novel by Thomas Cullinan, based on the screenplay by Albert Maltz and Irene Kemp as Grimes Grice. That's the original script for the previous film of The Beguiled. What year was that, guys? 1971. 71, okay. And I, the other thing I wanted to start it off with is the definition of to beguile. Because <laughs> I had a debate about this. To beguile in the uh, Google Dictionary says means to charm or enchant someone sometimes in a deceptive way so you know what i think i did the same thing thing too as i was rushing home and i thought be uh who is actually being beguiled yeah who is beguiled so and i still don't know so i'm just gonna lay that out there right there <laughs> And yes, and did anyone beguile <laughs> in this version? I mean, it was more Good like point. quite mild, like beguiling, you know, it was like... Uh, I wish there was some beguiling. I was praying for the beguiling to come, you know, yep. but... Mm, not, I mean... Not too much beguiling going there on. There wasn't even... There wasn't even like a touch of a penis or anything. Like you, you, you know, there wasn't even a flash of. Did you nudity. really need that, David? Did you need a yeah. penis touch? Who says the penis is beguiling? <laughs> Who says that's what it takes? That, that's I true. thought. I, I thought, mean, I'm not talking about. There was a long I, I, nipple I'm... shot. There was a reoccurring nipple shot during the washdown. Kept going back to was his there? nipple. It was centered. Okay, yeah, yeah, that was the the one scene where there was a little bit of eroticism. But if you've seen films like by Nier, Mira Nair, you know, mm -hmm. um, or um, mm -hmm. Adrian Line, I mean, those that's how you shoot erotic, right? Um, and there, so we didn't, I didn't get it as much as I could have gotten here. But let's 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 focus on what we liked first. Like, let's just go around and do, do um, what worked for the beguiled. Um, 2017. Okay, you want me to go first since I don't have deep thoughts. I just have quick one-offs. Cause you just came uh, from the film. I just came from the film. What I love was I love Colin Farrell. 
Mm. I thought he was really believable. I like that he didn't try to have an American accent and play an American person, but he played uh, a guy from Dublin. I think he is menacing. I saw Fright Night. And I, was, I was a little worried. I keep thinking about the vampire guy. But he was really good. And even when he stared down, you know, any particular girl, you could just, his focus, he was just there. Do we just say we like her? Can we do one up, one down? Um, You can do one down too, yeah. I, I'm not going to get in the big picture. I know we're going to go there. But what I will say is that the women knew they were doing pulp fiction and they were a little too hammy for me and not as believable as I would have liked. Hmm. That's all I have to Interesting. say right now. I'm still processing. Alka. One up, one down. Um, you know, I like the original film. I actually do. Even though, you <laughs> that know, doesn't there, count. I'm with you, girl. There, I'm with you. <laughs> there are, you know, there are politics now that kind of maybe it makes me a little uncomfortable to say that. Let's just say that. Preach. But I think that... Um, I like the source material and I, you know, I had read somewhere that um, the reason she wanted to do it is she wanted to do it from the perspective of the women, which I thought was a really interesting way to approach the material. Um, And so I was very hopeful. I, mm, I, I don't think that that was very successful. So that's, that's the thing. I didn't like this very much, as you can tell. Um, the down. Wait, where can should you tell I begin? Me what, can you tell me what worked? Wait, no, was no, that no. the one I up? Didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear enough. <laughs> that was yet. the one up. <laughs> that was the up. I need okay, to, I have one line that, that I liked. I have one line that I enjoyed, which was um, yeah. uh, Nicole Kidman sees Kirsten Dunst like brooch, and you know, like all the women are kind of a flutter with this you know, the presence of this man suddenly in their midst. And um, so they're all kind of dressed up for dinner and they're, they're just, you know, McBurney. It's it's a little, the air has shifted, Mm -hmm. if you will. It's like McDreamy. um, It's like, (laughs) yeah. And Nicole Kidman sees that Kirsten Dunst is wearing something. She says, "Um, I haven't, I haven't seen that pin since Christmas. And I just thought that was a great line, you know? So that was my up. <laughs> yeah, that was the one. I haven't that seen was that pin That was a great, that was a great scene yeah, when they finally invite him to, uh, yeah. to dinner. Summer. I mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought right. that was a great scene. And that's the kind of scene that you would expect, you know, fun and games, like, early in the second act and then we're you know by the time we get to the midpoint things are very very out of hand but i'm pretty sure that happened later in the second act you know and so let me say what i liked i really uh first of all this is a 93 minute film i give props to any filmmaker who does a movie in about 90 minutes i think it's the perfect time to tell a story um i also think uh, the cinematography of the grounds was beautiful. Those opening shots of the the trees and this sort of um, this this like monsoon looking uh, tree configuration was beautiful. And every time they went outside and you see the house from the outside, it gave that um, that feeling of the Civil War and that era. It was beautifully done and on a low budget. You know, she, it, was a, it was essentially a contained film in that house, right? And uh, I believe the budget was about $10 million, and that includes Nicole Kidman and Colin Farrell, right? And Kirsten wow. Dunst. So um, I liked that, the cinematography. Uh, I also agree Colin Farrell's performance was very compelling um i agree the first my 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 biggest challenge with it is that it did not the promise of the premise is something you talk about the premise of this film is a man enters a house of women and um the all the the total universe of things that could go wrong was not explored in this film, right? You know, basically it it the very the you know beginnings of things started to go wrong. Um, there were 
uh, seven women, I believe. One, two, you know, like seven women in the house. Um, only uh, uh, Miss Martha, Edwina, and Alicia really got fleshed out. Um, I think Jane was the one who was against him being there. Then the two little ones kind of could have been the same. Um, yeah. I, if you're gonna put seven characters in, they need to, they need to be independent. We need to feel them and feel their desires and uh, literally their desires in this situation because every one of them had a reason to be beguiled by Corporal McBurney. Um, I particularly liked um, Marie, who was the girl who found him, right? Isn't it Marie? Yeah. Um, or Amy? The frog girl. And, yep. Or is it Amy? can't remember the names i'm yeah um the girl yeah the frog girl who found him she was so you know she negotiated with him she was not scared of him yeah it was amy she was not uh, scared of him she was a very powerful character in the beginning and uh, i was hoping that by the end of this film that she like poisoned all the other women and saying this man oh. beguiled me, you know, like <laughs> I was looking for, you know, a total tragic escalation Shakespearean ending. Yeah, very escalate. Well, it tried to be Shakespearean, right? They killed the dude with mushrooms, but they all sort of got along doing it. Um, or, or it would have been <laughs> sure. nice even if at the in the mushroom scene when. Edwina Kirsten Dunst goes to eat them and 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 Miss Martha says, Oh, don't do that. And then yeah. little Amy goes, Shh, let her eat them. You know, like You like should I write w- more horror, David. I think you have a horror <laughs> bone you haven't tapped into. That's all I gotta say. It comes at I just, night. That's all I gotta I say. I just yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, we were talking about it. go go see our It Comes at Night podcast. That was a great, great one. Um, but I thought that this really was quite mild. That's my hashtag beguiled, hashtag quite mild. Like, it, it just didn't go there. Um, I do, uh, before I, I give over the mic, I want to say I would like to talk about two, before we get to structure, I would like to talk about one, this as a feminist film, and two, I'd like to talk about, um, I forgot the other thing, major thing I wanted to talk about. So, Culturally, culturally maybe? Maybe. Um, the gender gender versus cultural film. I think, because, uh, you know, one big thing we haven't, like, we should preface this with that, that kind of sets you separate from us, David, is both Alka and I have seen the original and this mm-hmm. and can compare and contrast anything you want. Like, any scene that you was give it the to other, us, that, we that can was talk the other about thing. the differences. That was the other thing. I want to take, let's not do that right now. Let's do that next. But um, I want to take a segment. Let's do five, at least five minutes on your guys' analysis of the original versus the, the current. But Fair let's enough. jump into this as a, as a feminist film because um, Sofia Coppola is arguably the most famous writer-director out there. I can't think of that many writer, uh, women writer-directors, maybe Jane Campion, um, who uh, in TV there's there's more showrunners, right? Um, like Genji Cohen and but like um, in still in the in the in the the auteur world, she's still uh, one of the greatest uh, you know feminist filmmakers out there. Do you how did it, how she's just the most one of the more well known because of her father and because of the legacy she created on her own. I don't know if she's the greatest. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's 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 right let's okay I well don't, well I don't known know, well known you know, she, and she's know early. She's I think she's there's something. There's something interesting about her gaze. Like if we talk about the way Sofia Coppola sees the world or these worlds, that's what's distinct about her. I think um, what I have come to about her and I always I want I want to like her more than I think I like her. I can. I can. I'm going to try. But I think the problem is, is that, you know, at first I was kind of like, Oh my God, you know, she's just like, she objectifies women in very much the same way that 
men objectify women, but it's it's not. It's a very particular way. And so I kind of I've I've backed off of that um assertion years ago where I kind of thought that her gaze you could substitute for any man. Now I see it as something where it's like if a woman could I objectify another woman's body, it would look like a, it, it would be a Sofia Coppola frame. And we do. We look at women in this certain way. Wow. And it's hard to um, it's hard to articulate. But, it, it, you know, she kind of captures that visually like, uh, you know, and I think that's what's distinct about her is that while she objectifies, um, while she um, uh, kind of puts her, you know, her gaze on women in a very subjective, um, you know, um, it seems almost fetishistic, it's almost fetish- it's fetishistic. It's fetishistic. Exactly. Yeah. It's fetishistic, but it's in a very, like, it's in a dreamy way. Because you it's do- in a gauzy yes, way. Exactly. It's like, if, because you have, it's, it's like, a it's feminine fog machines and you make it seem nuanced. Doesn't mean you're still not having the original gaze that, of Laura. Exactly. Uh, There's Laura something Maldi. about that gaze same. that is, because you're yes, still it starting is. at bosom. And, you're still starting at alluring spots that you know articulate what a man's desire is, regardless of how many fog machines. And I call her the but fog you're looking machine at queen. It. But you're looking at it as a say, woman, and I would I would say this is how you are you know you're looking at it as a woman. It's because there's something almost it's asexual the way Sophia sees women. Like you see women like um in a lot of her films where they're kind of they're objects of beauty, they're objects of desire, and yet there's absolutely true. nothing sexual about that gaze. So that's what's distinct there too. No, you I, know? I think you're totally wrong. It's kind of like making a sexy sheep. She have you did you notice how like everyone's waist was super cinched, including Nicole Kidman who was smaller than uh uh, uh Fanning and she's younger. I, I looked at that and I'm like, okay. You can objectify, but if you make them look really beautiful, we won't realize that we are being like we're we're sharing the masculine gaze, regardless of our gender, at these women. Yes, we, sh- we there sexualize was, all of them. There, but I so, don't feel so, like so, it's sexy let me, at all. Let me just t- let me really? let me speak from a male gaze perspective ah, of this film. Um, I right, I thought David. that <laughs> yeah I I, I I'll be I'll tread lightly no i be think honest, that honest, there is uh for me watching feminist uh filmmaking television the um marquee scene is the woman using uh the toilet we have started to see this in television in the last uh uh five years ten, five to ten yeah. years i think i saw it on orange is the new black pilot first and i was like and oh wow that's interesting yep. i'm a i'm a man and I've never seen a woman use the toilet on TV or film. <laughs> and, and so th- to me, I was like, what is that? I was like, oh, and that, and that I was like, and I was like, that's the female gaze. Okay. Cause the, it's not afraid to show, you know, men have been, you know, pissing in urinals in films for a hundred years. Um, but so, and, and there was a, there was a, a, a scene in the Begald with a woman on the toilet. So, and, and then I was going to also say about the, the dress, it is a period piece and she loves doing her period pieces, right? She loves you know, just, pieces. just, you know, and, and so, pa- the, so the costumes, <laughs> the costumes, um, <laughs> are, you know, her, I can see Coppola's goals being all very aesthetic and making things beautiful. Um, I can't necessarily comment on uh, what you guys are saying as what you see as a female director objectifying female actors in a film led by women. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to comment. Wait, I'm going to yeah. I'm going to jump back in and I'm going to say this. I think I love Sofia Coppola. A Virgin Suicides, I love it. I don't think she objectifies at all. I think she makes period uh anarchy palatable mm-hmm. to men. 
So if there's a little bit of like um, Boxing Helena, which is another movie about like cutting people's limbs off, she makes it very delicate, very soft, very proper. She did this. This is not the first time she's had like maniacal women or women that were going over the edge. They were just so beautiful. I'm not giving this up. And she puts a freaking smoke machine like all over every one of her sets. Everything looks so glowy. That's her aesthetic. I'm I'm not taking away from that. I I'm and I'm not taking away from. There are bigger. We'll get to the bigger clips about um the other and and um cultural problems I had with it. But so far as the feminist gaze, I think she did just fine. I think uh, we're not comparing the two films yet. I'll say this. I think my problem is uh. Shoot, we can't get into it because it goes back to the other and, and slavery. So I'm just going to leave it right there. You, you go. All right. It's up to you. Um, so. <sighs> okay, wait, David, I'm going to yeah. go there. Go there. The black girl. Yeah. Actually, it's two black girls on this podcast. I'm just saying. <laughs> We're going to go there just because we have seen the original and I feel she took opportunities. When she took an opportunity that it wasn't this drug-induced montage that happened in the 1971's version, but he really didn't know whose room he was going into, I felt that was beautifully nuanced. Like, you don't have Okay, you you have to explain to me and the audience who hasn't seen the original what the the difference... Granted, I'm only going to go scene by scene. I I can't do the whole thing. But I know... No, no, just the scene. Clint Eastwood... Had uh, was playing Col- Colin Farrell and Clint Eastwood are the seventy one and the nineteen seven or the two thousand seventeen version um, of Corporal with Clint Eastwood's rendition when he had that choice of whose bedroom to go to. You know there was this montage, very uh, Jefferson Starship, where you didn't know whose bedroom because he was kissing all three women, and then you realize whose bed he ended up in. I was like, oh, that's psychedelic. That's oh, so he has a dream sequence where he's kissing all three. No, that dream sequence was interesting because it belonged to Martha. That dream sequence was actually Martha's dream sequence. Um, mm-hmm. There was this like weird Christian mm-hmm. menage a trois that happened mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. he gets out of bed and oh, he goes down the hall it... and he's contemplating two doors that are facing each oh, other, right. right? And he one the on one, one side of the door there is Edwina, who he's supposed to run off with and who he's supposed to be in love with and on the other side is Martha who he kind of knows well this is where his bread is buttered he serves at her pleasure he's there only as yeah. long as she will have him so he while he's contemplating right, this pages. that totally character right. Carol comes down the stairs and says oh no it's, no we're oh, going this way right so but that weird psychedelic so, moment was Martha isn't 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 Aren't those three women in the original? Doesn't that make them far more active and uh, give them more agency in that Definitely. film than in, in the new and Beguile? It's, you know, right. the original that. had what this one didn't. You know, you guys kind of touched upon it earlier, but what, what it was missing was an inner life of all these characters. Whereas the original in set up and in like kind of conveying that group dynamic and those relationships was much more nuanced and much more clear. Like, you know, you find out, okay, well, this is a boarding school for girls, but um, Martha, who's the head of the boarding school, is going, has a plan. She's going to hand it down to Edwina. And Edwina, Edwina kind of—they they actually oh, got along better. They wow. got along yeah. far better in there. And so Edwina, like when that. she's like doing all this stuff with McBurney, it's like, you know, this is something that she never thought she'd do because she receives this like in the beginning when Martha says, "I'm going to give it to you as part of my, you know, your inheritance, and inheritance, you're going to get all right. this." There was something. So. You know, in her that's much in that higher performance stakes. where she kind that, of that, oh, the stakes yeah, are far higher in because the because yeah, in, in she 2017 kind of like, beguiled. There's a part Kirsten of Kirsten Dunst. You're just yeah. kind of yeah. hoping she gets out of there. Yeah, See, that, but this that was one, she, you're, she's right. Yeah, she's very reluctant in the beginning. Like she's kind of like, oh, that's so generous of you, but you know, there's kind of terror in her eyes. You know, where she's like, oh man, I'm stuck. I am cooked. This is it. 
And when you Were realize you the 17 she's never been with the, the, or the 71 version. 71. And you realize, man, she's never, you know, she tells McBurney later, I've never been with a man. I've never done, you know, whatever. So you realize yeah. that, oh my God, like she is living an entire life in this moment with this man. This is, this is it. This is her final play for any, you See, know, 100% life outside these gates. Because I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it the Carrie Cinder, the movie Carrie. Do you remember the innocence Carrie had when she first went to the prom? Oh yeah. She, the the original yes, Edwina was course. very much like that. She wasn't okay. I, no offense to to Kirsten Dunst, but Kirsten Dunst is really beautiful, and I didn't buy that she was just kind of this kind of plain Jane, ugly wallflower that was in a moment. It's kind of um, who played Carrie in the original? I'm I'm Sissy Spacek. Sissy Spacek. Spacek. Kind of, mm-hmm. The original Edwina was not really attractive. She was very plain Jane, and she was very like. If you give me a, if you give me any kind of like Rain Man medicine, she she ate it up, and you you felt bad for her because you felt like she really needed someone amazing and a miracle guy, and then you kind of felt like maybe Clint Eastwood really sees this as like a good move, and he is a good guy, barring the flashbacks. So I think it was more believable with the original. So I mean, it's it's stylized film. I didn't get too caught up on the believability of the emotions of the people involved. I just didn't see it on the page in the film. I didn't see their desire. And then I didn't see them making choices after based on the conflict that these, you know, seven women's desire created. And I want to, I want you guys to see if we can, if this was a script that we were reviewing in the Screenwriters Collective, what kind of screenwriting advice we would give to a script like this? What What is the 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 craft 71 issue? Seventy one or seventeen? Seventeen. That we are. This podcast is focused on seventeen. So I think the bigger issue here for me, I think we can discuss a couple of things. Right? It's all kind of tied in to what this is about, right? And I think this is a story that for me sits firmly within the Southern um, Gothic firmament. This is a story that has all the elements of Southern Gothic, and I'm going to tell you what those are, right? right? Oh, you're so mm-hmm. there, yeah, you, there is a yeah. decaying, I mean, you should decrepit see, plantation, see crim- you know? I just need to, um, I need to in do the a Civil plug. War. See, see, see our Crimson Peak podcast where we do a deep <laughs> for, analysis for of Southern Gothic. <laughs> romance. And why for we ro- thought Gothic Crimson romance. Peak... Right, what did we... Wasn't there... Didn't we think Crimson Peak should have just been uh, a... Uh, yes, it was going to be uh, Guillermo g- del Toro's Jane Eyre. Yes. Thank you. It was supposed to be just Jane it Eyre, right? Okay. at all. Right. Yeah. Um, it was so, gothic horror, please gothic continue. romance. Please continue. Yes. Yeah. So Southern this is gothic. Southern Gothic. Okay. This is like um, there's a plantation. Uh, it's in falling into decrepitude in this post Civil War South. This is, happens to take place in the Civil War, um, and a stranger shows up that kind of, who kind of offsets the balance of things in this homestead. Violence ensues, and white people have to compromise the civility that they're clinging to, right? And then there's, you know, there are other elements <laughs> Poor here white, that white are Southern kind of Poor civility. white people. Dear white people. Yes. Yeah, who have been like, who, who s- consider themselves genteel still. Yes, they're mm. holding, they're clinging, they're white knuckling through that. And there's a loss of innocence and purity. There's uh, the idea of imprisonment, that someone's got a disability. I mean, this hits so many of these markers. Um, But if you go back to the first thing about Southern Gothic is it is is definitely um, related to the Civil War. And at stake in the Civil War was what? Slavery, right? So here we have what has been like 
excised of this version, which is we go to this topic now, which is um, the black character in, in the 1971 version who does not appear in the 2017 version. And that's wow. why the 2017 uh, version feels hollow because notable. it is not grounded in its genre. It is not grounded in a civil war um, you know, narrative because it, this could have taken place anywhere. Really and truly, what what did this say about anything, you know, of its time? Are you, you know, saying the Civil that, War was that just like Southern, oh, are, are, a setting? So it was not that, informing the action. That's a that's a mic drop. So what you're saying is that the Southern Gothic genre of storytelling is yeah. a reflection of uh, Southern white culture. Um, Yes. Finally. No, 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 no. Finally. It's not. It's not. Finally. In decay. I, I, I'm in just, decay. Let me just f see my thought. Right. Finally, finally being held responsible for this original sin of slavery and their civility called into question where they can be civil in their clothes and their food and the way they act. Meanwhile, they're enslaving human beings. You, yes, that is definitely kind of part of it. But yeah. that's definitely. I'm gonna part yes, of and I'm it. gonna know this, and I'm gonna plug right now, Alk. Okay, so Alka, you just blew my mind because I have to do a new podcast, and I, Christina Leith Mallon, do a My Final Girl podcast about Black women, women and American horror. My new episode is about Southern Gothic gothics, but I actually paired Beloved versus Frailty. And now mm. I'm thinking I should do a beloved versus the beguiled. That's interesting. Yep. Well, Christina, can yeah. you can you can can you comment on Alka's um, definition of the Southern Gothic as it reflects on this film? Ah, oh, I love you, Alka. You're ugh, oh, goddess. Um, so here's the thing with Southern Gothic. Gothic. It's not just uh, white regret. It's it's the the predicament thereof. Thus, when beloved Oprah Winfrey's vehicle came out, everyone like everyone was like, "Oh, this is Oprah Winfrey wanting to do a ghost story," but she actually told a slave narrative, but not from the Southern Gothic white perspective, but from the black perspective about like, what if you sacrifice your child because you don't want them to go into slavery and they come back as a ghost? But people weren't ready for that, so they cast it off. But it is very apropos to the Southern Gothic movement and kind of opening up or expanding the cultural idea of what a Southern Go American, a Southern Gothic is. So, And I think here, going back to Beguiled, is that if you're making this kind of a film, right? If this is, it's like, I feel like she fought that a little. She fought it in the sense that this really, the setting and um, the action and the characters were not, you know, they came from this era of the Civil War, but they weren't um, they weren't in um, like in conflict with it in a way like living to preserve something else. Right. And um, he didn't upset things as much. And I think that's what the black character did for the first for the original version. For the she original the version, right? Truth. There was no sense that, she was that like, these women she were. She was, um, she was somebody who, you know, she says, "Okay, I take my order. I don't take my orders from anybody but Miss Martha." Right? Wait, um, but we have to rewind, telling people that in the 1971 version, one of the characters that was missing. There were two characters missing in my mind: the slave who was on the cusp of possibly being free, but she worked for a slight board uh, um, a south boarding school so she actually was much more honest because there were no men to kind of reprimand her than you would, could normally be as a slave in the south and there was also the white girl that i think got pulled into other characters that said why isn't the nigger doing that do you remember when she was the one yes. of the white children was plowing and she's yep. like why isn't the nigger doing that and the geraldine page was like she has her own duties and you felt like there was this kind of like Geraldine Page respected her slave as you're probably going to be as you're probably the same age as me. And we're probably going to run this together to some extent. So I'm going to respect you at a higher level than many slaves would have. In this oh, time she had it. No, precipice. I, I, 
I think it was deeper than that. I think she realized how much she needed this woman. And that's why there was this respect and, um, you know, frankly. So now you can lead into the the, the rape scene. And and let me just say. The rape scene was the most amazing. Her comments and let me the slaves comments and were let, priceless um I, i'm gonna let you take that but i just want to say one thing about what happens with this the slave character also articulates something really interesting because she's a she's a you know she's a character who's unafraid that's what we're trying to say is that slave character she was um, she was on the pre- precipice of her freedom and boy did she know it because um uh, when Clint Eastwood, as John McBurney says to her, you and I are alike, Hallie. Um, we're both slaves. And she said, no, we're not alike. I can run, right? Because he's injured his leg. And so there's there's a real um, comment on what oh is going God, on right. in Amen. this period. And that's why it's important mm-hmm. to have this character, to take this character out is really to kind of unmoor this narrative it. from its okay. genre, from its you've setting, it. from its like... It's like taking Viola it, it, Davis out of doubt. You, you've, you've gutted a really Yes, it's critical. It's like a t- two-legged exactly. stool all of a sudden. Agreed. So uh, can I respond? Yeah. Can I respond as someone... Can I respond as someone who didn't see the 71? And say, oh my God, like that entire thread is missing. And the he fact that he was, he friends with a black was girl that had held captive with him, is kind of a joke in the beguiled 2017. He's bare, he's, he, there. And I would, I'm very curious if the black slave character in 71 what would what was her perspective on the women's quote-unquote hysteria around this man which what role did she play in the beguilement in the 71 version i'm gonna let uh, alka flesh this out but i will say we talked about it the very interesting point that is totally whitewashed and the sofia coppola point is that the very first woman that he suggests to rape is the black woman, the slave that's about to get her freedom. And her line is, I will die before I let this, you touch me. Yeah. She is so, and this is what, and this is what was important about her is this is a woman with her. She's the one woman who's not falling all over herself in that house. Not afraid. Not she is the one woman who is allowed to touch his body. Actually, she is the one who washes him down, who shaves him, who does these kind of things because um, Martha thinks like uh, the other girls will get too hotted up, or I don't know what the deal is. But she's the one who touches him because he means nothing to her. It's a job to her. Exactly. Yeah, and that's important to see this man in like one character who's just kind of maintaining her wits, Mm -hmm. you know, while the other, the whole house is a flutter. Even and and in nineteen for you, you are not my friend because you call yourself a yank. You are not. I don't need you. She is the one fucking voice. Excuse my language. Just doesn't need him. And you know, there's um. So she's the character who is not. Beguiled. Not she's at all the character beguiled. who's not beguiled. That is the point. No, you just hit it. You just hit it. She's the only one not beguiled. Okay. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So, where <laughs> does can we can we try to see where would Sofia Coppola get off by removing this dimension from the story? What? what where could that possibly have come from? I'm going to say this. I think she thought to herself when she saw it that it was very, very pulpy, very pulp fictiony, And I don't want to have to do super extra PR in the middle of Black Lives Matter to actually make the wrong step in my script here. So I'm just going to make it all white women. I think she just took a pass on being on having the ability to, to totally cope and deal with that. I think it's bigger. And I'm I'm not trying to give her an excuse, but I think like. Hello, right now, if you're telling me to do a Sri Lankan piece, I can't because I really have to, I would have to step to it not being within that culture. 
And even if there's a volatile Oh, that is so different. Like no, no, no. Christina, no, I, I love just, you. I, no, 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 no. Sri Lanka that is like a so stupid, different. Obscure, but I'm saying that is so I different. She, could she handle is not... it. I think she was scared about what's going to no. happen to her if she even no. touches anything remotely slave no. or Black Lives Matter. Are you kidding me? I think she, I'm not, I hate the fact that she whitewashed. You know that. But I, I know, but I'm saying you She's are not presenting it like, you are presenting it like this is, this is a character that's like, um, you know, going to um this is our protagonist this character is a supporting character an important character as we've just discussed but i think Truly. this is a person who likes to iron out all tension in all of her movies to the point where i am getting to feel like if there's a choice to be made about me ma- having it mean something and mean nothing she will go yeah. with the mean nothing anyone who has seen somewhere knows that there is this nagging fear that you have um in some sofia coppola pictures that this is really about nothing you know and this is her her yes. uh, so I dreamy remember, gauzy I watched, she irons I, I really, stuff out hold on she this, irons this is, stuff out I do I'm trying to be no, gentle to no, the no. thing she couldn't handle this black lives relevant. matter I think you're being but, too I think you are being but, <laughs> too gentle is my problem Christina is because I, I think it's okay. like this is a person who did not want to do the work of making this relevant you know, this was a moment where, you know, she I, could have I, had if, something if, to say about something. Had she and put she the right doesn't. black woman and that's the in that role with her. and that black woman had yes. done that slave role, yes. that would have blown my mind. I it don't think she has okay, it. That's why she's I, not can she doesn't want to do the work. The, the and maybe she doesn't there. have black friends. She doesn't have people of color f- who, who will agree. tell her, like, you should tell probably you not do this. Black person in a Civil yeah. War story. It's like, it's a Civil War story, and yeah. there's no, you know, and I wanted to talk about The Keeping Room, which was a film that came out in 2014 yeah, yeah, yeah. that kind of is along similar lines. It's women on a homestead. Who, I'm not cute um, with that, and I know her from another world. I'm, I'm not I, I'm not I'm not locked into that yet. Who's the director? Uh, um, I, know I don't know. The... We can I'll look it, it up. Yeah, but, I'll look it up. Go ahead. Yeah. But the keeping room has um, has a similar idea, which is there are these uh, two women, their sisters who are kind of holding down the uh, family farm Brit, while the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah. While the Civil War rages Ooh, on, I love Brit. and um, there's a black character, there's their slave who lives with them, and let me tell you, that character, up like she upends everything because this is another person on the verge of her freedom, and who's still staying with her family, with uh, the homestead. Right. And it is such a critical piece of that film, and it is a really satisfying piece. Um, and I urge people who want to see a better version of something like this to see yeah. The Keeping Room. It's not but flawless by any David means, uh, but direct, it is an direct, important say, Directed by Daniel Barber. God, whoever yep. that. Written by Julia, Julia Hart. This is Julia Dan- Hart wrote that script, and the script is great, too. For those of you who can um, track that down, the script is really good. Uh. David, from the get-go, you've been saying, where's the tension? Where is the motivation to go? Or what's where are the stakes? That I think that comes... Yes, it's, it's a big cultural problem, but where are the stakes here? And this movie didn't have stakes, and I will agree with you to that, that it didn't have stakes, but... So... So, but let me, let me, let me make a comment because I was listening to you guys making very strong points. And actually... You know, talk when you're talking about um, when you remove whether whether Sofia Coppola could have put a black character. No, into stop! Her I'm film. gonna stop you right there. Just the way you phrase that, I love you, David. As a white person, Sofia Coppola could have put a black person in her film. Is the wrong way we ach- we approach this shit. Sophia Coppola could have seen the implications of what Civil War meant and incorporate all the people that lived and died for the situation. That's how you yes. approach it. Agreed. Agre- I, I hear you. Um, I'm ta- I want to talk about the, the tension issue that you guys brought up, right? Which is that she removes tension from her films. Um, I saw sure. somewhere and we left the film thinking interesting aesthetic, but it could have been called nowhere because it, it didn't tale. go. She's a fairy tale queen. Yeah. Right. 
Um, and then um, Lost in Translation, possibly her most emotional, does go places, but it's there's a lot of nebulous... Uh, uh, conflict there. The Virgin Suicides, her first like v- big outing, has a lot of conflict. I love the the, you know, the group of boys and the group of girls. I mean, it works because of the conflict. She didn't shy away from it back then. Yeah. But if we give, if we start to look at her oeuvre as one that removes tension, she's more. In, what is she more interested in? The aesthetic, definitely the the. Aesthetic. the she, yeah. She's I never mean, addressed anything. She, Even with Maria... Lost in Translation, I'm sorry, and I'm I'm going to say this modestly. I feel like she is a, a New York or, you know, a coastal hippie. So it wasn't hard to say, I'm going to put a cute hippie from New Jersey, Scarlett Johansson, with a sage old jaded actor, Bill Murray, and see how that pans out in, in Asia. She didn't really stretch. She she enhances what she knows. She things you don't know, like this piece. That, that was a very autobiographical. How... Totally. That was a very autobiographical film. It was definitely from her experience. Yeah. And let's not and ask Japanese people. Let's not ask Japanese people how they feel about this film. So. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> just throw that yeah. out there. <laughs> that would be a really big, but bad podcast. Yeah. So. Yeah. But. I get. So I, I don't want to get too. Her, I don't want to get she is too lacking in her bashy cultural about understanding and her cultural element. Yes, if you just want to make a fluff film, if I will, she wins at. I know a Sofia Coppola. Pretty much, kill me again for saying it, but there's a fog machine. Everything has a slight glaze off over it. There's like pink and blue hues that, that are softened that make everyone's skin look very peakish, very cute. But if you talk about like hitting real issues, I don't see that in her her aesthetic. It, and that's okay. That's okay. I, I, I just think just... both. I just think both of your arguments are super valid. I don't know that, and and because we're on a podcast to talk about the beguiled, the film sure. that she made. I I don't know that she's interested in dealing with those issues. But here we go. And I'm, I'm your, curious I'm your grindhouse if we girl. can. The black girl is also your grindhouse horror girl. So you know what? If you're going to step mm-hmm. to our Roger Corman world, our Doris Wishman world, then you have to honor that. I feel like she she basically said, "I'm going to take a black exploitation movie, but make everyone really nice. No one has food stamps. They just give hugs for money and food." No, I if think you're going to step I, into I a world, I don't think and, she and wanted to do pulp. She doesn't, she, but she, she took a pulp. She didn't want to do pulp. Novel. She wanted to do a period. She wanted to do a period piece. I think it's it's very very. Um, it's high advised mm-hmm. to 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 remake a film and strip out the black roles and the. And, it's super. And the, it's not even Black Lives Matter. The, the heart. Uh, Who's yeah, uh, Baz? Yeah. So, Baz Luhrmann. I'm saying. I'm saying it wrong. The gentleman that took Romeo and Juliet and made his own kind of Leo DiCaprio thing. Yeah, that was Baz. That okay, was Baz. So you can do it, but it's not a once over like I can do it because I'm so and so. You really take the R and D, the research and development to structure out a real conversion of your idea. So you could take Pulp you're pra- Fiction. You're praising Wait, Romeo and Juliet. No, but I'm I more so than the Beguiled because you know what Quentin Tarantino. All the stuff he takes is from every boner he's ever had for everything he's seen for 50 cents in the 70s. And he's revamped it. But he takes time and he owns it. Culturally, she does not. That's a big, big issue, especially now. You can't. Can you match? Okay, just tell me this. Alka, David, I'm going to show up for the next 10 minutes. Tell me if we had done a Pulp Fiction without a fucking black person. Tell me if we'd done any Tarantinos without a major minority. And and he doesn't even like, hey, here's your black person, except for Django. I, I, I'm not going to talk about that. But he, so he, he what you're saying it. is you can't do you can't do Southern Gothic without without black characters. Um, I don't think that's slavery without I, blacks. Yeah, I think I think it's like right. you, you you do have to. It's it's not impossible. I I don't know that I want to assert that it's absolutely impossible to do Southern Gothic because look, you know, there, there's like a fine literary tradition of Southern Gothic that's all white. You know, like did Tennessee Williams Frank have was all white, but they didn't characters. talk about the Civil War. Yeah, Alka. it's not. 
exactly. That's that's the point here. It's like it's contextual, and especially when you have this 1971 um, film reference point, and and let's just say that film is kind of thought as like Ugh, whatever because you know you have these weird voiceovers. It's kind of you know there's there's a cheese factor there too, but I think you know one of the most uh, strong parts of that film is this black character is this like woman who has this strange agency in this house of you know where they're all imprisoned it's it's very um it's very strange to me that that's the character you remove it's it's just bizarre like when you think about it as a person as a person who's living in you know um 2017 uh, USA, where there is so much um, racial tension when we, we have the dialogue that we have, not just Black Lives Matter, but with Republicans, yeah. frankly, with, you know, I mean, how how do you make this film without a black character and just kind of give yourself a pass and say, well, I don't do that. It's weird. It's strange. And it's irresponsible. Well, I I think it's very ill advised. I can't understand where why that choice was made because you you very well could have kept all the characters in the film and just made everyone more beguiled. You know, I could understand where she would take a character uh, who sees through corp. Corporal um, McBurney's, uh, uh, yeah, this you know, not... yeah, yeah. If you have a character, if you have a character who sees through Corporal McBurney's sort of edifice and sees what he's doing, that does, um, re- uh, that does p- relieve tension. So I, I did like the fact that nobody in the house had their wits about them. That does yeah. not mean that you can strip out. Uh, the black people from slavery from a Southern Gothic. So I feel like the I beguiled was Colin in the sense that if we, let's just put the black character in 2017. If we hypothetically say that the slave was the one that was unbeguiled, then, then it's easy to say that the beguiled was Colin Farrell, Clint Eastwood that thought they were getting over but they became like the slave and unbeguiled. Does that make right. sense? Right. Yeah. I mean, in, and it's in, frankly in this interesting. Film, it's interesting it, where in this film uh, it, it pits it pits it pits Martha and Edwina against each other. But that happened the, in both debate, films. It just didn't start off that way in the yeah, seventy one. Right, right. In, in this film, the only tension is between Martha and Edwina about who is less beguiled or who is more beguiled. Wait, wait. Elle Fanny's character, Alka. Alicia, is just a, is no, just a, is just a, no. a, a sex symbol. But that's not the right? 71. Alka, remind me, wasn't it like the teacher versus the like slutty girl in the original? The mother, the, the head mistress was kind of like an add-on, but the two that really fought for him... Were the two young ones, right? Yeah, it's always been that. And when we get to structure, which I know David is ready to do, um, uh, we should definitely talk about Uh, that. We have five minutes, so (laughs) we can do structure in five minutes if you want. (laughs) And that's that's the midpoint, actually, um, Christina, was um, it's it's the two women where you have um, uh, the Elle Fanning character and, and the... Kirsten Dunst's character. Kirsten Dunst walks in on Colin Farrell and Al Fanning. I mean, that is your midpoint right there. So it is that struggle. That's between not your them. low point. That's not your all is lost. No, no. I thought the I midpoint so. was when they invite him to dinner, when they let him out, and that's when everyone gets dressed up. Now it's it's sort of a new world. Well, um, I think that injury is the, really me, the midpoint, right? Because it sends things off in another direction. And the second half of the film losing is involved, the leg, yeah, that is not not the, but that injury when he goes down the stairs, that's really the midpoint because that's what sets that's, him ooh, into I saw that full as Dark antagonist. Of the soul ter- stuff. I don't agree. I think, <laughs> I, think I, I I thought the 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 sex with the young girl plus the subsequent falling down the stairs. 
The cutting off of the limb was all is lost into Dark Knight of the Soul, and now we're in the third act because uh, now he's angry, and they are no longer uh, charmed by him, and they need to figure out a plan to deal with this man in their house, and the third act is how they deal with this angry man in the house. Um, um, for me, the I, midpoint really was when, when they finally invite him to dinner and everyone is all tarted up and they're all accepting of each other's and noticing each other's, um, uh, is that the first beguilement, one? The if first you will, I'm, we're tra- we're talking, we're, no, the early beguilement is all like. The, you know, can I go in his room? I'm standing outside of his room. Can I get you anything? Like, there's the, a lot of the little stuff, and that's our that's our fun and games, right? The beginning of Act Two. Um, the, you know, I only think two beguiles. There's only two dinner services. One that goes really well, and one that goes really south, though. Yeah, two set pieces. Two set pieces. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it starts I, out so quickly. They bring him home very quickly, Alka. What was the catalyst for you? Um, the catalyst was... The, incite, the find, inciting yeah, incident. Yeah, she finds, she finds him. Um, he's injured. And, yeah, I mean, um, that was so yeah, quick. That's like within within like a minute, she finds him. She's out looking for which, Which is something that... Which is something that, we, we, you know, you can see eager screenwriters making that mistake, not, not spending enough time in the setup so that we get to see these girls, how they interact before the interloper is there, get to know them. Then she brings him home and they debate it. They talk about it. There's conflicts. Maybe somebody says, no, he can't stay here, which I think we got. And then the break into two is, no, he's staying. Exactly. We're going to heal him. We're not going to give him, we're not going to give him to the Confederate uh, 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 soldiers. And then, okay, we are you know, together act two until begins then. with a little yeah. beguile. And the, the B story okay. is uh, and Kirsten Dunstan. And then act two Dunstan. begins and there's... All right. Yeah. And Farrell. Yeah, I mean... Like uh, yeah, I mean, and 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 I can't and I can't believe that they left out that bit about the headmistress bequeathing the the school to Kirsten Dunst because that makes that makes a, such a great choice. Choose this man who is uh, sexual and who is uh, so you know, you know, who's calling out to you in one way when you've been hoping sure. your whole like sort of adult life to become this woman who you admire. And she's told you she's giving you the school that creates such great tension. Mm-hmm. Frankly, until you guys mentioned it and until somebody else I was talking to mentioned it, I didn't even realize it was a school. I just thought it was a bunch of chicks no. on a, on a, on a, <laughs> uh, in a house <laughs> because, really because all, the, all the dudes left. Loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't think they they can, mentioned it was a school. They're, no, listen. They're, okay. they're I don't doing think they, French In 2017, they even mentioned doing it's a school. Needlepoint. They're doing things that, yep. you know, this there's, is what, they're certainly this is, imparting this is some what knowledge in that place. Ladies do. So wait, I, have what, new, the, I have a new one This one-off. is what Southern women do. It's wait, like down there. Slow Abbey. down. When's the last time you were hanging out with Southern American women, David? Stop. Here's my one up. In the, in the Civil War... I have not. <laughs> My one up for Sophia Coppola, and I think we've kind of tapped on it, is she is very particular for her aesthetic. So showing the women stitching. We spent a lot of time on that sti- stitch is too close, that stitch is too far. And I think she wanted to show the particulars of how women really address how they aim for perfection. I'm not judging that. I'm just saying she, as a, as a filmmaker... That's her aesthetic. She loves to put women, like, forecast women in such a way. It's not my thing because we're different. But I respect that. But it's polar different from the the book, the, the 25 cents novel that she decided to adapt. This is not that. This is about women that technically 
the what I saw the seventy one version is about a group of proper women that unravel in a really dissenting way, like the movie Descent, and I didn't see that the the unraveling the, the that's such a great that's such a great comparison Christina the descent which which really pits everyone against them each other. and and you know if we were going if we really wanted to to Sofia Coppola to be this great uh, feminist director she would have focused her story on how um, how the cattiness between Primal women. It's even more and, spooky and how, than not, just... No, not, not just catty. Further, take it completely sure. back to, like, cave woman times. Make these women... Show how human they are. Show how flawed Do they can be. Do you see the irony in having a black show, woman that's reasonable yeah. and not beguiled? That's the irony we keep talking about. Having a black woman, like, yeah, no, he's well, not all that. I see that. Trust me, let's hook this. I see, up. Like, I see that in 19... Totally well, I see that amazing. in the 1971 version because there was a, th- and you know this better than I do. There was the, the, um, the film convention of the uh, magical mystical Negro, right? Where you have a wise black character in your right film, now. right? Where you have a wise black character in your film. Magical Negro um, came up like a be- little bit later, though. We were still doing Marvin Van, but, Van People in the seventies. That was more in the eighties. But, but, is, into the 90s, but isn't this Negro. the same? Isn't this the same thing? Isn't it like a guilty liberal director saying, "I'm going to make the one wise character now. the black slave"? <laughs> but no, 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 no. Because you had the magical Negro. Then when like writers realized, oh, we can't have that like vagabonds. It's like, oh, I'm Morgan Freeman. I'm playing God. I'm I'm Will Smith. Now it's just kind of like we make a decision with marketing. Are we going to not address that or address that? I kind of feel, and I still go back to the fact that I kind of feel like it's she's not it's not an original script. It isn't like this is what's in my heart. So I think Sofia Coppola was adapting and said that's going to be hard to tackle. Our th- our thing is going to be like on, and I want to give her the benefit of the doubt. And I know Alka's going to get mad right now. I want to give her the benefit of the doubt and say, well, should we? And there were marketing execs that said. Fuck that. Black Lives Matter will descend. It's not good. Just write this. I know it sounds shitty, but do the feminist perspective. Like they, ang- marketing execs can angle shit. And even though, unless she was 100% behind, like, no, this needs to be told. And she stands her ground and she's like, okay. And my dad said, okay. It became whitewash. The sad and unfortunate part is. You're going to say Sofia Coppola whitewashed. Other people are saying Sofia Coppola whitewashed and killed her, her Negro out of it. But and it's going to fall, descend on her shoulders. I think it had part to do with marketing. I promise you. With, marketing is the marketing gets a bigger budget than production in a lot of picks. I'm kidding you not. I'm, I'm sure you're not wrong there, that it play, it's a factor. Let me ask you, though, if they, if they what if we rewrite this and we take the 1971 um, black slave woman and we put her into 2017, but we beguile her too. Wait, no, Colin no, this is, is charming. Alka, charming. I'm not sure how I wait, feel about wait, wait. It. I, I, hold on, hold on. Cool with it yet. Ch- because because clearly, what Sofia Coppola is concerned with is having a house full of women who have no defenses so against this be man. Anton. But then there was Sojourner Weaver saying, ain't I a slave? Don't I deserve the same thing as white women? When Susan B. Anthony was hanging out with Frederick Douglass, is like, yeah, if you're going to get that because you're a black man, I should get it. She didn't, like, incorporate the rest of the, the, the women. It was only white women. Don't go there, David. Don't go there. I'm just saying. All right. Be careful. We're going <laughs> to, we're a little, we're a little over. Let's do last comments. Anything you didn't get to say that you're dying to say, and then uh, one positive, you know, takeaway and one um, uh, uh, constructive criticism on the beguiled 2017, which is what this podcast is about. <laughs> um, who who would like to go first? Alka, um, I'm done. Alka, you still there? I'm still here. I'm still here. And I am going to take this moment to talk about the original versus the new. I know we're talking about the new one, but I think that when you remake 
there has to be some idea here that's bigger that you want to um, expand the notion or dig deeper or do something different. I think my problem with this film is that it really did nothing. It did nothing. And in fact, it was a very shallow version of the 1971 film. I felt like in the 1971 film, there was more sexual tension. For instance, Miss Martha had a big incestuous relationship with her brother, which they kept referencing. Wow. Right? Oh my God, you totally and right. And that's what she was haunted by. She was haunted brother. by that. Yes. Okay. Then, you know, you had um, Edwina, who was haunted by the specter of, you know, her life as a spinster. So she had this rich inner life and a reason to kind of, you know, um, be with John McBurney. And there were these young girls who were also had this kind of cloistered existence and who were, you know, trying to break free or trying to get some taste of the outside world. There was, there was a lot more tension and a lot more group dynamics, you know, um, it felt more dangerous. There was more, it, it was gorier. Okay. And, um, yep. uh, we, we saw what happens to these people who were trying to take to prison. I mean, they were going to shoot up if they tried to run. I mean, it was, it was scary. And Martha that sees situation? that initially. Um, oh my God. The ironing was, out of was, tension. Like, as you said, it's crazy. There was a scene, there was a scene where two Confederate soldiers no, were, were in the house rounds. and she gives them, and she gives them no, food and the first, they're not even wait, there. Wait, and wait, in wait, the David, first David, version, David, you're going to tell Christy. Wait, Alka, tell about yeah. how the two Confederacy in the original come to the house. The original Confederate soldiers come because they heard that there were women alone and they felt like they needed their presence. And really, they were just like leching. They were there like mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the women. And it was stressful wow. to watch Martha village. get mm -hmm. rid of them in the middle yep. of the night. Because, yes. and, and the girls say it's very scary when your own side is so, you know, um, are the bad guys. Yes. It's, it, it, they say things like that that are just way more nuanced. And, um, uh, you know, Martha is so, and I think it's like this whole character and the, and the Christianity and the sex, it's kind of like this big cauldron of conflict and tension. And, you know, you feel the heat of the freaking South. It, it's like, yeah. there's no heat here. There's just like this sun dappled darkness. And it's I, you know, it's too soft. I'm not, I'm not into that for everything. You know, I think it's like, um, I've seen this from her. I wasn't so I wasn't so blown away by uh, the aesthetic or the cinematography or anything. It was fine. It was it was something we've seen. Um, I don't think that it. Christina, allowed do you want to? I'm just no, one last I'm thing. Listening to I don't think it's, it She's went right, into character. It. Nothing, nothing about the way this film was shot gave you a view of the inner life of these characters either. Now, if you're going to say so little, like let your camera, let your frame do some of the work. And that didn't happen either. So this is my, my big note is why was this remade? There was, there was no reason. There was nothing added. In fact, you know, we lost, we lost a lot. David. This is a three part, maybe two part, but I'm thinking three part segment because she took something that you said everything that I'm thinking. She took something that seemed pulp fiction and it had so much nuance, so much relevance that she was afraid of that it got lost. And I wish Barbara Streisand had done it. There are so many things that were just, there were boil. Okay, like, imagine this right now. David, you there with me right now? I'm here. Imagine if the next thing Sofia Coppola does is do the right thing. Yeah. But <laughs> what? So, <laughs> what? I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm hearing exactly. what you're saying. And I, and I, and I think, it, again, it was an ill-advised choice to remake this film. She could have done Southern Gothic, 20 different ways Agreed. she could have done her version 
um, you know, of an, any other uh, uh, s- Southern Gothic film, a- if she was interested on putting a microscope on women's sexuality in the face of, uh, you know, you know, like enormous uh, influence, a man they couldn't possibly say no to. She could have explored that in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, Totally. And I think you know if it, all I can all I can glimpse is that she really was trying to do the Sofia Coppola sort of subtle microscope on women's sexuality and in in the presence of an overwhelming male. And some, she chose. Uh, on, she definitely absolutely. See. Yeah. My, yeah. My my biggest issue was what even though you're like oh Pulp Fiction. Those 70s movies, black exploitation, exploitation, sex exploitation, they suck, they're stupid. Because no one had expectations, they actually put real lenses on things. And so if you're talking about woman versus woman, minority versus minority, so you're talking about a black woman versus a white woman, a black woman as a minority versus a Yankee as a minority, there were levels that she needed to understand and decide, yeah, that's out of my depth, especially now. That that's what that's my biggest thing that that the Alco is very eloquent about discussing. There were like layers to this onion that were never tapped upon, and it it's it it hurts. And it's hidden it hurts under the banner right of now. feminism. That's what the problem exactly. is. Also, is that you feel almost like, but wait, we should be we should be really thrilled that this woman is getting so much attention she's a female director she's a competent director but i feel like under this banner there is there's you know there's racial stuff happening there's um you know narrative uh, there's narrative nothingness frankly in her films and i'm i'm not sure you know that this is this is a filmmaker i'm super interested in anymore i just have to say that because well, let me let me let me let me as so in the last few minutes let me let me play devil's advocate one last time and say if uh, sofia coppola has nothing in common with spike lee except what <laughs> if she resented being the female face of filmmaking how would you feel about and if you were the, in he's those the shoes? black face of filmmaking yeah so then let me see Sophia and he, Coppola. And he resented do, it. He, she got gay. He resented it for a long then, time. Then, 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 yeah, I swear to God, I put that out to you. If, if Sophia Coppola's assistant's assistants should happen to listen to this podcast, do talk to Spike, because you're both New Yorkers, and do a version of She Got Game about a black woman that like had various black male lovers and had to like play the feminist card. Because I don't, I agree 100% with Alka. I think she her blinders her like horse blinders are feminist but there are a lot a lot of feminists that are not white and she needs to open those and it was very unfortunate that she didn't do it this time considering there was there were other people in the original other people there was a slave counterpoint that needed to be part of this narrative that was a critical, critical Ooh, counterpoint, Great. critical. It was a critical piece that's missing. It's not about, you know, um, can she tell it? Can she do this character? No, that was too easy. She took an easy pass and, you know, she kicked, she, she really excised a very important piece. Yep. I think that's She's a great Susan last B. word. Anthony, this shit. I'm sorry. I think that's a great last word. <laughs> um, guys, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast tonight. I want to thank Christina Leith Malin. I want to. Do you have a podcast to 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 pitch? My final girl, the Black Women of American Horror. We'll put that. We'll put the link to that in the show notes. And um, Alka Kushalani, do you have anything to pitch? Um, 
I don't, but I want to just reiterate that The Keeping Room is a good film to watch as a, you know, a counterpoint to this one to see what this black character could have been or to see a black character, frankly, um, in the Civil War done particularly well and find the script, read the script. It is, is so good. By Julia is, Hart. Uh, off the top of your head, guys, Southern best Southern Gothic film. Beloved. Alka, oh do you have gosh. one too? Um, um, I'm getting uh, oh, skeleton key. <laughs> oh, they're still a white blonde oh, girl, wow. but okay, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, but they're bl- Guys, they're black people in that in script. that in that um, film too that are like I mean talk about critical to the narrative and um, there's there's interesting this stuff is there. Why but you may uh, go part two and three. We're not done yet. <laughs> We're not done. Yeah. I think I think uh, I think it could definitely be explored more. I want to thank my screenwriters. Thanks to the audience. The script is produced by David Negrin, edited by Zoe Alexander. Remember, if you like the script podcast, please give us a five star review on iTunes and subscribe to the script YouTube channel. Join our Facebook page by searching for NYC Screenwriters Collective. Follow us on Twitter at Script Feed. You can support the Script Podcast at patreon.com slash the script.